your Messiah Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Blessed are you, Yehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. Remain stands. We read from the scriptures, Exodus 19, 3 through 6. Also from the writings, Proverbs 6, 23, Psalms 119, 165. And also from the Brit Kadashal, Romans 8, 1 and 2. Moses went up to God, and Adonai called to him from the mountain. Here is what you are to say to the household of Yaakov, to tell the people of Israel. <clears throat> you have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I carried you on eagles' wings, brought you to myself. And now if you will pay careful attention to what I say and keep my covenant, then you will be my own treasure from among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you will be a kingdom of Kohedim for me, a nation set apart. These are the words you are to speak to the people of Israel. From the writings, Proverbs 6, 23, Psalms 119, 165. For the mitzvah is a lamp, Torah is light, and reproofs that discipline are the way to life. And those who love your Torah have great peace. Nothing makes them stumble. Kiner mitzvah ve Torah or ve derek chayim tochot musar. Shalom rab lo chabai Torah teak ve in lamo mikshu. In Romans 8, 1 and 2, therefore there is no longer any condemnation awaiting those who are in union with the Messiah Yeshua. Why? Because the Torah of the Spirit, which produces this life in union with the Messiah Yeshua, has set me free from the Torah of sin and death. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who gave us Torah of truth, that everlasting life in our midst, and blessed are thou, O Yehovah, the giver of the Torah. Hallelujah, shout holiness before you have a seat. That was kind of a weak holiness, but holiness indeed. <coughs> We've been on this journey about the call to holiness, understanding what God wants. We understood that <coughs> in order to walk in holiness, we have to understand sin. And then we not only have to understand it, we have to call it what it is. Sin is sin, correct? And so to understand holiness, we have, to, uh, we have to admit that our problem, our situation, our circumstance, our struggle is sin. And then we move beyond to understand that this relationship that we have with Yehovah <coughs> creates this holiness within us because he wants us to be conformed to the image of his son. And if we are here this morning just because you have to be here, then you are here under legalism, not holiness. If you read, if you pray, if you study, if you worship, all because someone is requiring it of you, it's legalism. If you're here because you love him so much and want to have an expression of that love in your worship, in your praise, in your reading, in your prayer, and in your attendance, <coughs> that's holiness. We're looking at holiness. We talked a little bit about legalism. We're going to talk more about legalism today. We're going to talk about license today. And then we're going to wrap that up, and we're going to move from that point to another point next week. But when we look at Romans chapter 8, 1 and 2, it says, We are therefore now in no condemnation, those who are in Yeshua. <clears throat> we read Psalms. We read Proverbs. We read from the Torah portion this morning that talked about he wants us to be his people. He wants to love us. He, we are his treasure. The word of God is good. The word of God is righteous. We understood in the book of Psalms that the Torah, if we follow it, will bring us peace and we will never stumble. So if you look at that, that means when we stumble, it's because we walk away from Torah. Legalism <coughs> is deadly. License is damnable. That's what we said last week. Legalism is a man-centered in its efforts 
calling us to walk in the spirit in the power of the flesh. I want you to understand something as, I <clears throat> as we unfold again legalism and holiness and license. You do not have the ability to be conformed to the image of the Son without the Son. Without the Spirit of the living God within you. Holiness is God-centered in its efforts, calling us to walk in the Spirit, in the power of the Spirit. Even with our children, we'll say, stop that. You know better. Do this. And really, <clears throat> sometimes, um, if you're expecting flesh to become perfect, you're going to be very disappointed all your life. Right? <clears throat> you're going dis to be disappointed with your mate. You're going to be disappointed with your children. You're going to be with life itself. Because if you demand someone to be what you want them to be and demand them to line up without the Spirit of God, they cannot. They can for a while. Any, 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 any pony can be taught something. Any, any monkey can do something. Right? But you have to be reminded. There has to be something that's empowering. <clears throat> See, legalism means that you're following God through the, through, um, the works of flesh with fear and judgment. I need to do this because I don't want to go to hell. Can we acknowledge none of us want to go to hell? Right? I don't want to go to hell. And if I see something that says you're going to go to hell, that well, I don't want to go to hell. <clears throat> so legalism means you follow God, but you follow it through the works of the flesh with fear. It's a form of godliness but you deny the power thereof. If we go to the other extreme, it's called license. And license means that you think you follow God, but you're driven by your own desires and your flesh, and you believe that God is okay with it. That's license. And therefore, you have no form of godliness, just a confession. You've confessed him, but there's nothing in your life to show for anything else. If we go to the middle, which is the balance, how many want to be balanced? Holiness is following God in all things through relationship. And that is having a form of godliness because of the power of God. We talked last week that <clears throat> a lot of us in today's church and today's world, we don't want to be disciplined. No discipline because we'll say, you can't tie me up again. I'm free, let me alone, let me do what I want to do, I want to express myself. We say, I don't want to be convicted, no conviction, because you won't let anyone condemn you because you associate conviction with condemnation. No biblical standard, because you say, who are you to tell me what to do? Well, there's a lot of people that can tell you what to do. The electric company tells you <laughs> to pay your bill. If you don't do it, they're going to cut it off. Right? So if you think you can roar through life doing what you want to do, that's, that's, I don't know where you're living except in a tent somewhere, but even the tent will demand for you to take care of it. See, we have to look at our society, and our society is saturated with sensuality. It's permeated with pleasure. We get it. We know it. We watch it. We hear it. We see it. We're experienced in it. The church is a mess largely due to the <coughs> understanding or the, the um pitfall, if you want to say, of materialism, a whole society. Remember, again, I don't like to go back to when I was young, but we didn't have as many choices. We didn't have as much things out there to grab a hold of, right? The only thing I'd had to do when I went outside was to pick up a stick. <laughs> That's it. If the bike was working, I could ride the bike, right? Right? If you found a feather, you stuck it in your head. Someone was a cowboy. Someone was an Indian, right? But even today, that's not politically correct. We played army. We played wrestling, right? We played smearing someone who had the ball, and hopefully you weren't the ball. Everyone's on top of you, and you say, get off! I can't breathe. That's it. That's, that, that was our fun, trying to hurt people. But we have this, all these things that can be offered to us and to our children. And I believe that is one of the problems within our society, within a community. We have just too much. Legalism is not the answer for our deep heart problems. It offers no cure. 
See, some of us have been in church. We have been in a, in a family whose rules and structures were through legalism. See, you, I can make my children do what I want them to do, but if I have no relationship with them, then what they've done is done what I want them to do in legalism. And usually when they get older, then they have this way of having a license in their life because they don't want to be under the thumb anymore, so they just let anyone do anything, and they do anything because there was no relationship within those rules and regulations. It was just, I want you to hear me, and I don't want to hear you. When I speak, you move. Any other time, you're just quiet. Dad had his chair, right? <clears throat> he sat at a certain place at the table. Everyone didn't touch anything, didn't move anything. If Dad came home, everyone was. Everyone knew, right? Nothing wrong with that in itself, other than if there's no relationship with it, then it just becomes legalism. See, <clears throat> legalism condemns rather than converts, and it destroys rather than delivers. And we are people that want to be delivered. Legalism exalts the self-righteous and tramples under the sinner and also tramples the hurting believers because we have to understand you cannot do it on your own, and you cannot help me do it because you are flesh and you are blood. What needs to happen is I need to be empowered by the Spirit of the living God. We need transforming grace, not sloppy agape, not greasy grace. We need transforming grace, something that's going to enter our lives and give us the power to overcome. Yehovah is calling us to come out of the world and be separate. We know that. Amen. You are, of, you are in the world, but not of the world. Be separate. Come out from among them. Do not walk with unbelievers. <clears throat> what, what good is uh, the, the, the believer have with uh, unbeliever or light have with darkness? Bitter and sweet can't come out of the same fountain. Right? We, we know the scriptures. So we understand that God is calling us out of the world. He's calling us to be separate. He's calling us to repent of our sinful compromise. He's calling us to break free from the dominion of the flesh. We all sit here with that. He wants us to present ourselves as a living, say it. You need to look up that word. That word sacrifice, right? <clears throat> living sacrifice. That means you're yielding and giving of yourself. What you want to do, you don't. You're a sacrifice. It's not your opinion anymore. It's not your thinking process anymore. It's a sacrifice. Everything's running through this word of God. Uh, <clears throat> this living sacrifice on Jehovah's altar. He wants us to be set aside totally to the will of our maker and our, our, our redeemer. And we need to heed the call. I quoted Oswald Chambers last week. I'm going to quote him again today. How many know who Oswald Chambers is? Some of you read his books, My Utmost for, the, for Tyus. He's actually a 20th century Scottish Baptist, don't hold that against him, <clears throat> and holiness movement evangelist. He's also a teacher. And this quote, I think, is powerful. You can take a picture of it. It would be great because <clears throat> I don't have time for you to write it. But it says the only liberty a saint has is the liberty not to use his liberty. See, I might be able to speak my mind to you, but the liberty that I have to speak my mind to you is that I have liberty not to speak my mind to you. I might be able to say what I want to say, and the earth is not opening up, and thunder's not coming down, and I'm not being electrocuted by God. But the liberty that I have should be the liberty not to engage. <clears throat> the liberty... That a saint has is the liberty not to use his liberty. Liberty means ability to violate the law. License means personal insistence on doing what I like. To be free from the law means that I am the living law of Yehovah. There is no independence of Yehovah in my makeup. License is rebellion against all law. If my heart does not become the center of divine love, it may become the center of diabolic license. That's a good holiness preacher. Might not be accepted or liked by many, but nonetheless, it's true. See, sin <clears throat> is a spiritual cancer. We know what cancer does. If someone said to you today you have cancer, <clears throat> there would be a fright that would go through you because cancer is something that devours, right? 
So sin is a spiritual cancer. It is a destructive plague. It is a lethal virus. What are we doing today with the with the virus in China? <clears throat> They're isolating, uh, holding people, putting people. Uh, uh, you know, if you went over, came from China, they would take your temperature and see if you had any symptoms. Then they would isolate you for so many weeks. And we would say that's good. Because the purpose is we don't want everyone else to die. Correct. So we would want to go to the extreme in order to make sure that everyone would have life. So why isn't it in our spiritual life when we know that sin is a spiritual cancer, when we know that it's a destructible plague, and when we know that it's a lethal virus, why aren't we doing something to isolate those things from ourselves so that we will survive or our children survive? Yeshua came to save us from sin. Someone say amen. But sin is the problem. Sin is the pollutant. Sin is the poison. It's not something to look at. It's not something to laugh at. It's not something to put on. Oh, yes, God is taking care of it. It's something to take serious. And this is why the human race experiences such horrific suffering on a daily basis. When someone says, why would God do this? God sent us his son that we might become holy, that this would not exist. But it does. Which is why millions, uh, we don't like to say it, will go to hell. And they will go to hell. Because they refuse to accept Yeshua as the Messiah. And then they live their life accordingly that it's going to destroy them. All sin is sin against Yehovah. Did you hear what I just said? The gossiper and the murderer. Same. Hello. We don't necessarily think that way. Because most of us fall in that little liar every once in a while. And certainly lying is not as bad as murder. And you would argue with me now, Pastor, I know in theory, but in your theory, through your eyesight, yes, there is a difference. But in God's sight, sin is sin. Sin is the pollutant. Sin is the danger. Sin is the cancer. Sin is the plague. Sin is the virus (coughs) and sin is the poison. And he wants us to be removed from it. So he wants to isolate us from it. You are in the world, but you are not of the world. Do not participate and be part of come out from among them. Why? There is a virus. So the question would be then, why would we as believers want to embrace a message that supposedly gives us liberty to sin? You know, the sloppy, agape, greasy grace. Why, as true leaders and even true lovers of Yeshua, why do we look for a theology, an ideology that justified disobedience of their deliverer and mocks our very master? Why do we want that? And you say, well, I don't want that. But a lot of times we do because we're looking the way out of the scripture instead of looking the way into the scripture. We're saying things like doesn't uh, deal with the society today. It's not for our culture today. That's what he said to the Jewish people. We'll make distinctions between Jewish and non, a non-Jewish. We'll make the distinction between the Old and a New Testament. We'll make the distinction between God of the Old and, <coughs> and Yeshua of the New. And the thing is, you're doing the same thing that I just said. You're trying to embrace a message that gives you liberty to sin and doesn't bring you to a place of conviction, you want your disobedience to be winked at and okayed by God. And we need to find the balance of holiness rather than go to legalism or rather than go to license. And sometimes within the church, we have run so far away from legalism, we've run to license. (coughs) Well, if I do this and say this and say this, my children will look at it and they and they will they will run towards sin. They only run towards sin if you're making these standards and regulations and rules without relationship. If they understand, if you bring them, if you train up a child in the way he should go, that doesn't mean just telling them what is right and wrong. That's telling them why it is right and why it is wrong and who he is that loves them so much to make a way where there seems to be no way. That's the training. So if you've been hurt by legalism, which we all probably have sometime. Do not cast off all discipline, restraint and holy fear and give place to the flesh. Don't overcompensate from legalism and go to license. Go to the middle to holiness. Understand what rules and regulations are, because the only difference between legalism, rules and regulations (coughs) and holiness, rules and regulations is that one is done through relationship and one is done through fear. The Spirit of God is moving this morning and he told us to breathe 
break down the walls he wants to, right? <clears throat> if you hear what he's saying and then hear what he's saying, you'll find that he's saying something to each of us. The spirit-empowered holiness is what he wants, not sin-driven license. That's the biblical option to legalism. If I'm going to combat legalism in life, we talked about it last week, <coughs> you, have to flan, you have to fan the flame, right? You have to get the, the fire back. And that's just a moment of you just deciding to get it back. Has anyone just, you know, had a bad thought, going down the wrong way, <coughs> whatever, and you just had to kind of like shake yourself, okay, no, no, no I can't do that. And you just, Right? I mean, it's, it's there, and you said, no, uh-uh. You, you, you recognize it, and you said, okay, no, and you made a decision. <clears throat> well, that's the decision. I feel cold. I look cold. I act cold. I need to fan the flame. Here's the decision. I don't want to be cold no more. I want to be hot. Hallelujah. And it will take some time because when you <clears throat> fan the flame, it doesn't e immediately erupt, but at least it keeps it going, and I'll keep fanning, I'll keep fanning until one day it's just exploding. Sin is not our option. Legalism is not a way to go. But spirit-empowered holiness is what God wants for us in our lives. <clears throat> well, one of the greatest uh, apostles and teachers to hear from would be Paul. We all like Paul until he says something we don't like. And he's going to say some things you don't like today. And that's okay because I can hide behind Paul. I didn't say it. Paul said it. Here's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 through 6. Are you ready? Are we starting to recommend ourselves again, or do we, like some, need letters of recommendation either to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You make it clear that you are a letter from the Messiah placed in our care, written not with ink but by the Spirit of the living God, not on stone tablets but on human hearts. <clears throat> Can I stop there for a moment and just say to you, I don't think we understand, including myself, the importance of what God has called us to do and why he wants us to become into the image of his son, because we are the letter walking. No one may ever open this Bible up and read it, but they read you. And unless you have faked it by telling them you don't know Yeshua, <coughs> they look at you. And when you say, I know Yeshua, then they watch how you act, what you say, what you do, what you what you post. Everything, because you are the letter from the Messiah. The only letter that they will know. So you don't want to be in legalism side, and you don't want to be in license side. Because then you're showing that he is legalism or you're showing that he is just licensed. And we know when we read the Gospels, he was neither. He was holiness all the way. Be you holy like I am holy. <clears throat> Such is the confidence we have through the Messiah toward God. It is not that we are competent in ourselves to count anything as having come from us. Someone say amen. On the contrary, our competence is from God. He has even made us competent to be workers serving a new covenant, the essence of which is not written text by the Spirit. For the written text brings death, but the Spirit gives life. Or another way that we have heard it is the letter kills... And the spirit gives life. And that's what we zone in on because then we say the letter kills. Therefore, the Torah kills. Therefore, I don't want anything that kills me. And the spirit gives me life. And the spirit is just all this feeling that I got. And we misunderstood what God is saying. He's explaining to the Corinthians that their very lives served as a letter of recommendation. Does your life serve as a letter of recommendation for the life that Messiah has given to you? Do people look at you and say, no matter what you're going through, you still have joy? No matter what you're experiencing, there's peace that passes all understanding? Do people look at you and see discipline and temperance and love and joy and peace? Come on. You are the letter. You are the letter. Yehovah has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So what is Paul saying? What Paul is saying and referring to are the effects that the law of Moses engraved on tablets of stone had upon the Israelites. And he called it the ministry that brought death. 
and the ministry that condemns men. This word, <coughs> this Torah, though it's good, and I'm going to say tell you how Paul said it was good, though it's righteous, though it's rules and regulations, what you need to know, and I'm going to say it over and over again for the next five minutes, this Bible, without the Spirit, will kill you. This Bible, with the Spirit, changes you. Did you hear me? People who are trying to follow the Bible without the Spirit of God are going to be condemned, found guilty. You can't read do not steal and steal and not be condemned. You cannot have a lifestyle contrary to the Word of God and read it and then not feel condemned. You will be condemned. But if you have the Spirit of God and you read it, then you know that there's been a way made for you where no one else can make the way <clears throat> through the Spirit of God. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 7, and 9. Now, if that which worketh death by means of a written text engraved on stone tablets came with what? Glory. Even though this text came with death, it still was glorious. It still has the power to change you. <clears throat> Such glory that the people of Israel could not stand to look at Moses' face because of his brightness, even though that brightness was already fading away. He comes down off the mountain after God writes the tablets of stone with his finger and his presence of God brings this Shekinah glory on him. So though it comes, these tablets of stone with the engravings of those commandments, though it could bring death to them, it still comes with glory. Won't the working then of the spirit be accompanied by even greater glory? For if there was glory in what worked to declare people guilty, how much more must the glory abound in what works to declare people innocent? So Paul says it's a glorious ministry. Paul was always careful to state that the law itself is good. <clears throat> See, we'll take that scripture and we'll read it. Then if it kills you, then it's not good, which is why God got done away with it. But God didn't do away with it. Look at Romans 7, 12 very quickly. What does he say? So the Torah, this is Paul. So the Torah is holy. That is the commandment is holy. It's just and good. So are you saying this letter that kills is good and just? And the answer is yes. The problem is that the law does not give us the power to live for Jehovah. Let me just try to make it simple for you. Not that you have to make it, make it simple. If you tell your child to clean the room and make the bed, and you demand it under legalistic positions, they will do it under threat of not having a uh, money, not having to go somewhere, not having to do something, right? <coughs> but when they leave your house, and grow up, if you haven't taught them the benefit and why and how come without payment, they'll never make their bed when they're on their own. They'll never clean their room when they're on their own. So, yes, did it make your life more livable? Certainly. Did it make you smile when you walked in the room and saw the bed made? Oh, yes. But it still was frustration for you because you had to continue to demand. If the teaching would have been, and it's hard for us because sometimes it's hard to do. You're dealing with all different people. But if we got them to the place at an early age and taught them <coughs> the, how, how, what that meant, respect for the things and respect for them and, and whatever, however you meant, if, you, if they got it, you would never have to tell them to do it again. They would just do it on their own. The problem with the law is that though it is just and good and right and holy, it doesn't have the power to change you. Romans 8, 1 through 4. We read 1 and 2. Let's read 3 and 4 of Romans <coughs> It says, uh, for what the Torah could not do by itself, because it lacked the power to make the old nature cooperate, 
God did by sending his own son as a human being with a nature like our own sinful nature, but without what? Sin. God did this in order to deal with sin, and in so doing, he executed the punishment against sin in human nature so that the just requirement of the Torah might be fulfilled in us. <coughs> he came and died as a, and, and, and took on our nature and then did not sin so that we could allow Torah to live in our lives through him, through the Spirit of God empowering us to change. So that the just requirement of the Torah might be fulfilled in us who do not run our lives according to what our own nature wants, but according to what the Spirit wants, because now we live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. Who empowers you? The Spirit. Why are you here this morning? Because the Spirit. It shows us the way without enabling us to go that way. If you just demand something of someone without teaching them the hows and whys, then you don't enable them. You just get them to do it, but you never enable them. Hence the key word, train up a child, instead of tell a child. They need to see you in worship. They need to see you loving him. They need to see you uh, on uh, the image of Messiah in you. They need to see your love for him. They need to see what you care about. They need to see what your main priority is. That's part of the training. Grew up in a church, uh, Church of the Brethren. We were a small church. Then we went to 1,200 people. We went to 1,200 people because we had a 21-bus fleet. Where 21 buses went on every Sunday and picked up people all across the community. 21 buses is a lot of buses. Started with one, ended up 21. Well, you know, with 21 buses, that's uh, 21 buses full of children, mainly. Thus, children's church. Because <laughs> you got 21 times 30. All coming in. <coughs> Some with moms and dads, but most not with moms and dads. You know why? Because mom and dad saw the importance of church for them and not them. Therefore, some of those children saw that they were coming to church not because it was important, because their greatest <coughs> example in their life is their parents. They saw then church as a place of babysitting and not a place of redemption. How do you teach your children? There's a little poem that I found. It says, to run and work the law commands, yet gives us neither feet nor hands. But better new the gospel brings, it bids me fly and gives me wings. Why did Yeshua come? To give me wings. Through Yeshua, the new covenant, we can now fly. The new covenant did not do away with the rules and regulations. It gave you the empowerment to follow those rules and regulations through relationship, not through fear of being killed. Listen to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Are you ready? <clears throat> it gets a little rougher. What is more, their minds were made stone-like. For to this day the same veil remains over them when they read the old covenant has not been unveiled because only by the Messiah is the veil taken away. Anyone sitting here without the Messiah can read this, but you'll never understand it because you're veiled. <clears throat> yes, still today, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But, says the Torah, but, says the what? Torah, whenever someone turns to Adonai, the veil is taken away. Now Adonai in this text means the spirit, and where the spirit of Adonai is, there is freedom. Freedom to what? Freedom to do what? Follow the Torah. Because you didn't understand it, but now you understand it. <clears throat> you didn't understand it, and the only reason why you would do it, not because you understood it, but you did it so you wouldn't die. Right? So what would you do? You would bring a goat, you would bring a bull, you would bring a lamb, and that was sufficient enough to last one year or until you sinned again. Right? And you were going to sin again, that's why he made it perpetual. Because the Torah couldn't change you. It could only cover you until the Messiah would come. It could only cover you until the Spirit of God could come and empower you to walk this walk by yourself through him. 
So all of us with faces unveiled, see as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. And we are being changed into his very image. Say it with me. What's the next part? From one degree of glory to the next by Adonai the Spirit. <clears throat> From one what? Boop. <laughs> That's a slow process, isn't it? Boop. Some of you will. Boop. One degree. One degree. One degree. How I many know one degree? Some don't even seem like a change. If I said, oh, this morning it was 32, and woo, by afternoon it was 33, did you feel it? <laughs> I'll be like, no. One. Boop. Just one. Boop. 20 years. Boop. <laughs> Been in this thing 30 years. Boop, boop. What raises the degree? Heat. Fan the flame. Get deeper in your relationship, and you might find, it might go beep, 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 beep. But the colder we are, boop. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom for license? No. Freedom to fulfill his will. Because it is freedom to become like Yeshua. Freedom to fulfill the law demands. Freedom to be holy. Yes, yes, yes. Amen and amen. There is no room for license in the words of Paul. But rather, through the power of the new covenant, we are presently being transformed into the image of Yeshua. And in fact, we know in advance he knew we would be conformed. <clears throat> I mean, how glorious this spiritual operation is. You couldn't do it on your own, right? If you're sick and you need surgery, here's Pastor Kenny, needs surgery on his arm. He never once said to himself, I'm just going to do the surgery myself. Why? Why didn't he say that? You can say it. He don't have the knowledge. Right? And if he had the knowledge, he couldn't do it on one arm. Correct? He would need someone. Someone to, first of all, give him drugs. It wouldn't be Nell getting them drugs, because Nell was very particular what drugs she gives out. I mean, uh, that sounds bad, but... <laughs> you all know what I mean. You all don't know what I mean, and that's okay. You can't do it on your own. And even if I said, Pastor Kenny, oh, I'll help you. <laughs> Listen, you didn't laugh that hard when Pastor Kenny was doing it by himself. Now you laugh when I say I'm going to help him. <clears throat> because we can't do it. You need an expert. You need someone who knows what they're doing. You need someone who has done it before. You need someone who has walked it out. His name is Yeshua Hamashiach. He has walked it out. He came as like we are, and he went through what we have gone through. He felt everything that we went through and had felt everything that we have felt, and yet he sinned not. And then he died <coughs> because he wanted to. And he came and he rose from the dead because God got him and accepted the sacrifice. And now he sent the Spirit to empower us. So lean on the one who is the expertise. Paul's epistle to the Corinthians are strong holiness letters. You want to read about holiness? Read the Corinthians. First Corinthians instructs believers that they must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral, greedy, an adulterer, a slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler. No. What I wrote you was not to associate with anyone who is supposedly a brother, but who also engages in sexual immorality, greedy. To me, that sounds like a big leap. Sexual immorality, greedy. Worship idols, abusive, gets drunk, steals. With such a person, now everybody start. 
you're not even supposed to eat with them. Well, why aren't you supposed to eat with them? <clears throat> so Paul gives us the answer in verses 9 through 10 in 1 Corinthians 6. Don't you know that unrighteous people will have no share in the kingdom of God? Don't delude yourselves. People who engage in sex before marriage, who worship idols, who engage in sex after marriage with someone other than their spouse, who engage in active or passive homosexuality, who steal, who are greedy, who get drunk, who assail people with contemptuous language, who rob, say it with me, getting rough in here now. So what he's saying basically is if these people are put out of the kingdom of God, then why aren't they put out of your kahila? And then <laughs> God's quiet. I mean, I don't know which one you're all facing, but I'm going to help you here in just a minute. Then he explains something to us. First Corinthians. 11, 28 through 32. So let a person examine himself first, then he may eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For a person who eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. This is why many among you are weak, sick, and some have died. If we would examine ourselves, we would not come under judgment. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along the way, <coughs> along with the world. He's not saying that you cannot struggle with any of those things. He's saying when you say, I'm a believer and I can still do it, you're in trouble. He's not saying that you're not sitting here <coughs> and you struggle with those things. Because we'll struggle with those things. We are still of the world a little bit. We're still fighting our sinful nature. Them and themselves can be <coughs> changed, can be covered by the blood. We, we go here, let him examine himself, and then, which means <coughs> you've fallen short, and you've fallen short. You ask, oh, God, I'm falling short, and I'm struggling with this. Some things are easy to give up. Some things are harder to give up. Some things, it's an easy pizza. There it is. I don't want it no more. Some things you can say give up because you never had a dealing with them. You might say to me, <coughs> um, here's drugs. No, I don't want drugs. Wow, you're strong. No, I've never had drugs, never did drugs. Never no, uh, I have no no motive to have a drug. But if you've had drugs, then that's a different situation. You can sit alcohol in front of me. I've never drank, never, never been drunk. never. So it's not, it's not a thing for me. So if I stand on my high horse and say, oh, no, I don't do those things. Well, that's, uh, okay, big dip, big will. But if you come at the things that maybe I'm dealing with and the struggle begins, Are y'all telling my mail? Did y'all say something about me? What? No. Then it becomes rough, which is why we have to have patience with one another, right? <clears throat> and then we have to also be honest with one another and be able to confront some of those things. No, that is not right. No, that is not true. Let's find out with the word of God. Now, I'm with you. And I'm struggling with you. I'm praying with you. I'm there. I'm pointing you to your to your freedom, to to your to your redemption. I'm not allowing it in your life without some sort of, hey, that's wrong. But what Paul was saying, when you just are a church of license and no one says anything. I mean, after he warned his readers, he told them to learn from the example of the Israelites. And I'm not going to read it, but I want to show it to you so you can write it down. First Corinthians 10, 1 through 12. <coughs> if you just glance through it, they all had the same drink. All led by the same way, but not everyone followed the same thing. Right? Don't be idolaters. Some of them were, as the Tanakh puts it, the people sat down to eat and drink. They got up to indulge in rivalry and let us not engage in sexual immorality. Some of them did. But the consequence is that 23,000 died in a single day and let us not put the Messiah to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by snakes. And don't grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroying angel. Well, hello. Now that all sat in our laps, didn't it? All those other ones, they were like, well, I don't know who you people are, but you need to get yourself right. And then he brought her on down to grumblers. Has there anyone here in this church never grumbled? Raise your hand right now so I can call you a liar. Wise, wise, wise. Even if it was the milk is no good or the bread is too stale or I'm waiting in line, you grumbled.
and they were destroyed by the destroying angels? Come on, that's a little extreme. <laughs> These things happened to them as a prefigurative historical events that they were written down as a warning to us who are living where? In the last day. What's he telling us? You only have one power that can help you through this and can change your life. You have to recognize <coughs> and get out of uh, legalism. You have to recognize and get out of license. You have to follow God in holiness. But you have to also realize you can't do it on your own. You need the spirit of God to empower you because if not, you'll just live your life in flesh. And he's willing to work with you because it's going to take one degree. One degree. Now, I know that we live in a day and age where everything is, and that's how we want it. We want our children to be perfect now. It's an impossibility unless you become perfect. Why are you requiring something of your children that you yourself have not set the standard for? You want your mate to be perfect. Is that going to happen? How many sit here with a perfect mate? Don't raise your hand, Gail. Flow with these people. Hallelujah. Sorry to that. No, I said no. <laughs> the second letter to the Corinthians, Paul gives one of the most beautiful calls to holiness found anywhere in the Bible. Are you ready? Let's read it. Do not yoke yourselves together in a team with unbelievers, for how can righteousness and lawlessness be partners? What fellowship does light have with darkness? What harmony can there be between the Messiah and Baal? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement can there be between the temple of God and idols? So he's asking us these questions. And then he says, <clears throat> for we are the temple of the living God. And as God said, I will house myself in them and I will walk among you. I will be their God and they will be my people. And therefore, Adonai says, go out from their midst, separate yourselves, don't even touch what is unclean, and then I myself will receive you. In fact, I will be your father, and you will be my sons and my daughters, says Adonai, save all. And therefore, my dear friend, since we have these promises, then let us purify ourselves from everything that can defile either body or spirit and strive to be completely holy out of reverence for God. Oh, how I want to please him. Paul was not advocating license, but calling us to make holiness perfect in the fear of Adonai, cleansing ourselves from everything that pollutes our body or our, or our spirit. Is it easy? Is it going to do overnight? No, one degree at a time. Will you be going through things? Do you struggle with things? <coughs> Are some of those things up there in your life? Yes, but you're striving to get them out by the Spirit of God. If you have settled in and say that's just who I am and that's what it is and God's okay with it, you're in trouble. When Paul writes the letter kills, he's saying this, and I want you to get this because this is the definition. The letter that kills means that externally imposed religion brings death, while internally birth religion brings life. You've accepted him, not just become part of something. I can run with a pack of wolves doesn't make me a, a wolf, right? And after a while, it would show me that I am not a wolf. As I'm collapsed, <laughs> panting, looking for water, and they continue to run. One written in stone, a covenant that condemns man. One written on a heart, a covenant that transforms man. Same law, same standards, same regulations. One through relationship transforms you. One without relationship kills you. Look at Romans 8, 4 as I wrap this up. So that just requirement of the Torah might be fulfilled in us who do not run our lives according to what our own nature wants, but according to what the Spirit wants. So Romans 8, 4, that's not legalism, that's freedom. To live your life the way the Spirit wants, because sin enslaves us, but the Spirit emancipates us. The flesh brings us into bondage, but the Spirit sets us free, and he who the Son sets free is free indeed. A holy life is a liberated life. 
to follow God's word means peace, joy. Remember, you are the message. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace. Is that your message? Is that what's written on your life? Or when you walk through the door, all hell breaks loose, and you're like, oh, Lord, here they come. The message of Yeshua. <laughs> no. Listen, we have to show the world the image of Yeshua in us instead of the image of the flesh. They have enough examples of the image of the flesh. We need to be the example of the image of Yeshua. Let people see Yeshua, not carnality. Let them see Yeshua in this house, not carnality, not flesh, not everything that's opposite of him. But here's the question, and I'll close. How can we strive for holiness with all of our hearts and yet stay clear of legalism? I'm going to give you seven helpful hints, not long, just very quick seven. So don't get nervous when I say I'm closing and then I give you seven points. It's seven very quick points that with a click twice you can have them. Number one, <coughs> you have to make every effort to keep your first love. Fan the flame. Any relationship needs work. Right? Make every effort to keep your first love. Fan the flame. Number two, live a life of thanksgiving and praise, which just means be a worshiper, not a murmurer or a complainer. It is so easy for us to be a murmurer and complainer. We complain and murmur about everything. And remember, I said this <coughs> last week. I saw it on Facebook, and I hate to bring up that I saw it on Facebook, but I saw it on Facebook. That when David came and looked at Goliath and, and was about ready to fight Goliath, you never hear him talk about how big, how strong, how mean, or what Goliath was. What you hear David say is how great, how wonderful, and how powerful God is. He didn't focus on what was the obvious. He focused on what God could do. And a lot of times what makes us murmur and complain is because we're focused on the lack or, the <coughs> or, the, or the, uh, uh, the, what is not happening in our lives and what we're going through in the situation and the circumstance instead of who is in the midst of that situation and the circumstance. We focus on the fiery furnace instead of the, the fourth man there. We focus on the lions in the den instead of the one who's closed the lion's mouth. And if we can learn to live a life of thanksgiving and praise, listen, we all go through things. We all experience hell. We all have mountains and valleys, and we all go through situations and circumstances. Not one of you has not been touched by something. All of us have been agitated by something. Things have gotten on our last nerve, and then some. But how do you respond? That's not easy. Number two is not easy. Because our first response is to murmur and complain. Number three, be very conscious of your own sins and shortcomings. Remember, before you try to take out the beam out of someone's eye, <coughs> there's one great big speck in yours. That's like you trying to tell someone who is having a hard time with their money and yet you're, you have none. And you're in debt up to your eyeballs and you're going to tell them how to save money. Let me tell you how to do this. Number four, give yourself to private prayer. Don't stop there. For those with whom you differ and those you don't particularly like. We pray for people we like. Oh, and then, Lord, bless thee. That thee, we love thee. Bless thee. Like a power of God be on thee, Lord. How let her come and go and be blessed. Oh, bless thee. And then the next one. We skip that one. Now, <laughs> shoo, shoo, glory. Byron right now, what? Did my name, someone say my name. There are people that maybe don't mesh with you, that you won't be their best bud. They're, you're not going to sit down and spend some time with you. You know, that's really okay. You, you do know that personalities sometimes mesh and some don't. Some are just amen. How you doing? Love you, sister. Love you, brother. Amen. That's all. You're not going to dinner with them. You're not going to do anything else with them. That's a fact of life, right? I mean, you, 
in your marriage, sometimes you eat with them, drink, and, and sometimes you're like, I don't even know why we're sitting across the table from each other. I have nothing to say at this moment. <laughs> I'm going out and do something. You go do something. <laughs> sometimes you mess, sometimes you don't. It's different times, right? But you need to <laughs> begin to pray for those that are differing, those who you don't particularly like, because you're going to see that's going to change you. It's going to change you. All right, number five, six, and seven. Are you ready? Here we go. Learn to appreciate the beautiness or the beauty of holiness. Quit looking at holiness as something that's horrible. These rules, these regulations, these things, horrible. Look at this, beautiful. Gail and I, we've been married how long ago? That's what I thought. That's why I asked. And I'm not even going to tell you what it is until you realize. A long time. <clears throat> and here's the thing, and I've told you this story before. I never made the bid. I'm just one of those guys that if you got out, why make it when you're going to tear it back up? Mary Gail, she's a bid maker, right? She makes the bid, makes the bid, makes the bid. And it wasn't until we moved from the downstairs bedroom up to the upstairs bedroom that I decided I'm going to make the bid. Now, every morning, guess who makes the bid? I make the bed, and I find now some sort of a delight to make the bed. I even find myself that I'm running out, and I can't, <coughs> you know, ha run out of time. Like we had to take Pastor Kenny to the doctor. So it was, uh, I was like, oh, man, I didn't make the bed. And I'll even say to Gail, I didn't make the bed. And then she yells at me, and then she screams at me. And I say, please forgive me. And then she makes me dinner. No, she says, oh, that's no problem. But now, because I made that switch, you understand what I'm saying? I made the switch. Now I, I find there's beauty in making the bed. Putting the pillows up where they need to be. Put the two little pillows like that diagonally with the one in the middle. I take pride in it now. Beauty. What you have to do is look at, and, and again, that's a crazy little simple example, but <coughs> when we look at these laws, we always look at them as, oh, this is horrible, this is so... No, no, look at him as beautiful, that God wants me to be like him. Do you, you do realize that when he made Adam and Eve, he made them perfect and holy. And the enemy came and stole that away from them. So now what you need to look at, these laws and regulations to be, are to bring you back to where he wanted you to be. Restoring back what the enemy has stolen from you. Recognize that as a part of your destiny, a part of your portion. Number six, be quick to recognize narrow judgmentalism arising in any area of your life. Even small things, we become little judges. Maybe you went to another church to visit on a Sunday, and you were like, well, we don't worship like this. We're, we're singing this song. Just enjoy what they're singing. I can't praise in this type of thing. Why? Praise. It's amazing grace. It's, is he, isn't it amazing? And isn't it grace? Then praise him for amazing grace. Now, it might not be your <coughs> what you want to eat all the time, but if you're visiting something, you don't have to stand in the corner. This ain't right. I ain't got nothing from this place. Just enjoy. Yeah, no one's dancing, no one's shouting, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean you have to do that right now. Right? But if you were here, you wouldn't be doing it anyway, but then when you get someplace that don't allow it, well, I don't know why ain't no one dancing, no one praising. I heard no amen. Well, you don't say amen either. Just recognize that sometimes we can become very judgmental in very narrow, tiny ways. We've got to catch that. Mm, that chicken, that's not the way I would have made it. Just eat the chicken. Be thankful that there is chicken to eat. Or just don't eat it. You don't have to say, oh, really? I don't eat barbecue. And the only thing on this thing is barbecue. Eat barbecue. Or don't eat it at all. 
Don't say nothing to Byron. Because he will put you in his prayer list. He will do number four with you. Number seven, the last one, never use the Bible as a weapon against other believers. Listen, there's uh, differing ideologies, different interpretations, depending on where you're at and how you've grown and what you understand. But here's a hint never to say. If I'm arguing with Teresa, not that it ever happens, but she's going on a mission trip, so it could. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, Teresa. We never argue much. And... uh <coughs> We're having this conversation, and so she's saying what she's saying, and I'm trying to say what I'm saying. And so I interrupt that by saying, well, my Bible says. What did I just say? Well, my Bible, as opposed to whatever you're reading. Don't use it as a weapon. Open up your Bible. Show them what you're saying. Get, take them through. Let them open up their Bible, right? Don't use it as a weapon. It's not a weapon. It's supposed to be something that can be used to bring people to the saving knowledge. And if you use it correctly, it will change people's lives instead of make them embittered. Well, then take your Bible. So we have to be set free from sin, right? And because we're set free from sin, we have become slaves of righteousness. Amen? So what's the bottom line? Here I go. I'm closing. Look, I'm putting my pen back on here. The bottom line is this. Read it with me. Here it is. What's it say? Yehovah is at work in us to make us like his son. And that is not legalism. To become like him is not legalism. Amen? Turn to someone and say, I love you. Hallelujah. Let's stand before Yehovah. Children, come. How are you two doing? <coughs> this tastes good. Some men, come on, men or ladies, they're not prejudiced. <coughs> Woo, hallelujah! Father, we thank you and praise you for every child that's represented underneath this prayer shawl, whether they be a, a Ephraim or Manasseh or Joseph or Peter or Paul or an Esther or Miriam or Sarah or Leah, or Rebecca or Rachel. <coughs> use them for your kingdom. Use them for your glory. Father, let us be an example, the letter walking of Yeshua, that they might have that imprinted on them, that they also will walk in the image of Yeshua HaMashiach as they yield their life, give their life, surrender life unto you. Use them. Bless them. Father, let them know that no matter what they struggle with, no matter what they go through, no matter what problem or situation or sin that comes their way, there is freedom in the name of power Yeshua and that the anointing of the Spirit of God can set them free he will not leave them nor forsake them but will walk with them one degree of glory to another degree making them into the image of the Son we thank you and praise you for their lives we give you praise always in the name above every name the name of Yeshua HaMashiach we pray amen lift up your hands to receive the priestly blessing this morning <coughs> Yahovah 
Yehovah, he who exists, you know, before you're presenting gifts and will guard you with a hedge of protection. And Yehovah, he who exists, will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards you, bringing order. He will provide you with love, sustenance, and friendship. And Yehovah, he who exists, will lift up wholeness of being, look upon you, and he will set in place all you need to be whole and complete. May Yehovah grant all the desires of our hearts, fulfill all our purposes and all our petitions. May Yehovah, hear from heaven, quickly answer all our requests. Save us in the day of adversity. And in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, defend us from our enemies, from poverty, and from bondage. Shabbat Shalom.